Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Happy Sunday. Uh, welcome to the Church of God of Prophecy, Simi Valley Sunday Bible Study. Uh, my name is Dexter Jones, and I'm sharing with you uh, a study uh, from the Church of God of Prophecy. This is our weekly Bible study. Um, we're in a um, new uh, lesson. This is the spring edition of our uh, One Accord Bible Study Magazine. Spring 2021. Man, time is just moving on. God ain't waiting for no man. He's coming back soon, he said. It's spring because uh, I had to get out my weed eater yesterday. I'm a little bit sore too, man. That weed eater. When you get older, you don't do things the way you used to. It's a little bit more difficult. So I thank God that he's given me the ability to provide and to nurture a family of uh, five boys. And uh, he's blessed me with a lovely wife who I love dearly. And I'm very thankful for all that God has given me. And so I try to be obedient. I try to be obedient to the call of God. And I, I truly believe he wants me to share his word with you. And so I'm coming this morning to share the word of God. Uh, before I do that, let's pray and thank him. Dear Father in heaven, we come to you this morning to thank you for being the God that we can count on. The God that we don't have to question or doubt. The God that we know because he said it. He works all things in our life for our good. And dear God, I thank you for this opportunity to study your word, to find out more about you so that I can draw nearer to you. Because nearer to you is the best place I could ever imagine. Thank you, Father. and Please allow this study to bless someone to increase their desire to know you and to follow you. And I thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 <clears throat> so I'm going to read the introduction for this new uh, section of uh, lessons, the spring quarter. And it says, this quarter of lessons covers difficult to understand portions of Scripture as well as providing an overview of the letters of 1st and 2nd Peter and Jude. Scripture always takes some work on the part of the reader to come to an understanding of what the writer, the biblical writer and the Holy Spirit has to say. The difficulty with interpreting the Bible, especially those difficult to understand passages has to do with several factors. First, we are separated from the biblical writer and his initial audience by centuries. Second, we are from cultures very different from the original recipients of God's word. Third, there is a language barrier in place that must be overcome. The Old Testament was primarily written in Hebrew with some Aramaic, while the New Testament was written in Kony Greek. Even when translators have done the work 
of, put, of putting these ancient documents into words that we can understand, we are just not privy to certain idioms and figures of speech that would have been readily identified by the biblical audience. These considerations and more make proper biblical interpretation hard work. However, it is not impossible work. With time and the right tools, we can understand what the word of God meant to those who first received it, as well as what it means for us today. There are additional factors that can make understanding the scriptures difficult. One of these is addressed in 2 Peter and Jude, the presence of false teachers and their false doctrines. What can we do to recognize and reject false teaching when it arises and even makes its way into the local church? Some, certainly not all, of what Peter and Jude teach us is that we must know God's word well enough to recognize when something being taught is inconsistent with scripture. The only way to grow in our understanding of the Bible is to give time to reading and studying it regularly. Second, false doctrine is serious. To allow false teaching to go unheeded is to invite God's judgment. Third, every generation of Christians need to teach the faith to the coming generation. Fourth, like the church on the day of Pentecost, we need the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. If we are to be faithful in our journey with Christ, which includes dealing promptly and appropriately with false teaching and those who teach it. May the Lord grant you a spirit of understanding and conviction as you study his word and head off false teaching when it comes. And that introduction was written by Keith Mariner. <clears throat> okay. Uh, section one. Difficult passages in Genesis and Exodus. Even difficult scriptures contain truths for our benefit. The lesson overview. This lesson is about a mysterious spiritual experience received from God by Abraham. Then about a dangerous encounter with God by Moses. And finally, about a unique vision of God granted to Moses. These events are explained or examined in this lesson because many Bible readers find these accounts difficult to understand. In reading the Bible, two extremely important practical questions should be uppermost in one's thoughts regarding any passage of scripture. One, what does this passage tell about God and his will? Two, what truth does this passage reveal that applies to my life? Both these questions will be answered for all three of the scripture passages in this lesson. 
our golden text is from the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 29, verse 29. And it reads, The secret things belong unto the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children forever. Okay, section one is titled Supernatural Experience. And references are Genesis chapter 15, verses 7 through 18. And let's start our reading of the Bible in Genesis chapter 15, verse 12. When the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and lo, and horror of great darkness fell upon him. Verse 13. And he said unto Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them and they shall afflict them 400 years. Verse 14, and also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge, and afterwards shall they come out with great substance. Prophecy 15, and thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace Thou shalt be buried in a good old age. Verse 16, but in the fourth generation, they shall come hither again. For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. Verse 17, and it came to pass that when the sun went down, and it was dark, behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp that passed between those pieces. Verse 18, in the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram saying, unto thy seed have I given this land from the river of Egypt unto the great river the river Euphrates. <clears throat> and the commentary reads, after being in Canaan for eight years in obedience to God, still Abraham and Sarah had no heir, no son, through whom the promises of God made to them could be fulfilled. Genesis 15 verses 1 and 2. Therefore, God came to Abraham in a night vision, likely a dream, and reassured him the promises made to him would be fulfilled. Verses one through five. Abraham believed God, but still asked of God additional assurance concerning the promises he had made to him. Verse eight. In answer to Abraham's inquiry, God instructed him to prepare sacrificed animals for the performance of the ancient ritual of covenant making. In obedience to God, Abraham sacrificed and laid in order on the ground the animals and birds God required. This is in verses 9 and 10. As the darkness of another night descended, a deep sleep fell on Abraham. Verse 12. God revealed to Abraham that a nation would be his descendants, and the nation that would descend from him would live as aliens in a land not Canaan for 400 
for four centuries. Verse 13. After which God would judge that nation. Bring out Abraham's descendants with great substance. Verse 14. And cause them to inherit the land of Canaan. Verse 16. This prophecy was fulfilled when the Israelites were delivered from slavery in Egypt by God's servant Moses and later took possession of Canaan. Along with this prophecy, God also assured Abraham that he would live a long life and die in peace. Verse 15. Apparently awakened from his sleep, Abraham saw in the darkness of the night a fire pot and a burning torch passing along the path between the halves of the sacrificed animals. Carried by the unseen hands of an unseen person. This was the ritual for covenant making. Verses 18 to 21. What is strange about this event or about this covenant was the nature of it. Most covenants required both parties to fulfill certain obligations. Failure on the part of either participant to keep his end of the agreement would be cursed. However, only God passed between the animal parts, thus symbolizing that he alone made the terms of the covenant and promised to keep it. Wow. Very important and, and wonderful story about God's relationship with Abraham. Very nice. Okay, section two is titled Dangerous Omission. And this is from the book of Exodus, chapter four, verses 19 through 26. And we'll start reading in verse 19. Exodus 4.19 reads, The Lord said unto Moses and Midian, Go, return into Egypt, for all the men are dead which sought thy life. Verse 24, It came to pass by the way in the end that the Lord met him and sought to kill him. Verse 25. Then Zipporah took a sharp stone and cut off the foreskin of her son and cast it at his feet and said, Surely a bloody husband art thou to me. Verse 26. So he let him go then she said, A bloody husband thou art because of the circumcision. <clears throat> the commentary reads, At about age 40, Moses escaped from Egypt to the Sinai Peninsula after murder, murdering an Egyptian. That's from Exodus 2, verses 10, 11, and 15. There he lived the next 40 years of his life with the Midianite descendants of Abraham. Genesis 25, verses 1 and 2. Worked as a shepherd, married, and had two sons born to him by his wife Zipporah. It's Exodus 2, 21. Uh, then, when Moses was about 80 years of age, God spoke to him from a burning bush and called him to be the deliverer of the Israelites enslaved in Egypt. This is Exodus chapter 3, verses 2 through 10. 
So Moses took his wife and two sons and set out on the journey to Egypt. Chapter 4, verse 20 of Exodus. The brevity of this account requires any interpreter to engage in informed speculation about the full details of what happened. Many Bible scholars believe Moses suddenly became gravely ill to the point of being near death. Apparently, this happened because Moses had failed to circumcise his youngest son, Elizer, before setting out for Egypt. The assumption is that Elijah was born a little more than a week before Moses and his family began this trip. And yielding to the objection of his wife, Zephapur, Zippor, Moses neglected to circumcise Eliezer on the eighth day after his birth, as commanded by God. It's from Genesis uh, 17, verses 9 through 14. Zipporah quickly realized why Moses' life was in jeopardy and circumcised Elijah. Her obedience to God ended the crisis and Moses was restored to health. Why did God take such drastic action in dealing with Moses? Because Moses was going to deliver Israel as a representative of God of Abraham Isaac and Jacob. God would not allow him to begin his mission while he was committing a grave sin of omission by failing to circumcise his youngest son. <clears throat> okay. God deals with sin and a, even a sin of omission has consequences because God is a just God and he will not uh, allow um, sin to go unpunished. Take note, section three, forbidden vision. This is from Exodus 33 verses 11 through 23. Exodus thirty three eighteen reads, he said, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. 19, and he said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee, and will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. Verse 20, and he said, thou canst not see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. And the Lord said, behold, there is a place by me, and thou shalt stand upon a rock. Verse 22. And it shall come to pass, while my glory passes by, that I will put thee in a cleft of the rock, and will cover thee with my hand while I pass by. Verse 23, and I will take away my hand, and thou shalt see my back parts, but my face shall not be seen. <clears throat> and the commentary reads, during Moses' first day of 40 days on top of Mount Sinai, receiving the commandments of God, Israel fell into idolatry. And God spoke to Moses about destroying them. Exodus 32, 1 through 10. 
in answer to Moses' intercession, God relented from destroying Israel. But Moses was concerned that God would not be present with them as they continued their journey to Canaan. And that's from Exodus 33, verses 11 through 15. Therefore, Moses earnestly invited God to continue to be present with them. And God granted his petition. Verses 16 and 17. The Bible says, The Lord spake unto Moses face to face. As a man speaketh unto his friend. Verse 11. Moses heard the Lord speak audibly and sensed his presence, presence, but did not see the Lord. Moses desired a more complete acquaintance with God. So he prayed to the Lord, show me thy glory. Verse 18. Moses wanted to see God in full glory of all of his attributes. God replied that no man could see him and live. Verses 19 and 20. However, God said he would arrange for Moses to see his back. Verses 21 through 23. The fulfillment of this is told in Exodus 34, verses 5 through 8. What was the significance of seeing God's back? It meant that God is so infinitely great in the glory of all his attributes that even Moses could know God only a little and never completely. The same is true for every person. All that people can see of God's face, face has been revealed in Jesus Christ. Second Corinthians chapter four and verse six. I can understand Moses' desire to see God. I, I think we all have that desire in us. If we have faith in God, if we have a relationship with God and, and we know God, we want to know more. We want to see. We want to use our senses in our relationship with God. But that's not God's will. We're not ready to see God. We would be destroyed if we saw God in these fragile bodies. We have to mature in our understanding and our relationship in our reverence, in our obedience, in our love of God. We have to grow intimately more personally related to God. Because when we see him, we will be like him. We are maturing and experiencing a relationship that will lead us to being like God. And he will change us in a moment and we will be like him. And we will see him as he is because he is God, and we can trust his word. 
call to discipleship. <clears throat> As Christians, we are followers of Christ and followers of God. Abraham and Moses were followers of God. The three episodes in their lives told in this lesson reveals that followers of Christ and God experience God supernaturally as their lives are continually transformed by him. They experience God's love manifested as corrective discipline. They experience God's desire for close fellowship with them by his continually increasing their spiritual vision of him. Rejoice always for the privilege of being a follower of Christ and God. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. God wants a closer relationship with us. He wants to mature us so that we can be like him. Thank God that he will not give up on his word. He declared that if we believe, we would have everlasting life and we would be his and he would be our God. And he'd never leave us, he'd never forsake us and forever and ever we will be with the Lord. I pray that something you heard this morning encourages you to seek God and a more intimate knowledge and relationship with him. God is so good. There's nothing that compares to the love of God. There's nothing, nothing you could desire that comes close to that relationship that you have an opportunity to have with God. So seek him, seek his face. He's there waiting for you to turn to him. I thank you for your time and I invite you to come back next week for another scriptures difficult to understand. This one is titled Wars of Extermination. God enables us to live victoriously over evil. So come back next week and let's study this. Um, check out my posts during the week to prepare for the study. I, I encourage you to study the word because that is a commandment of God. Study his word. So I encourage you to do it. Thank you again for your time and have a blessed Sunday. Goodbye.